Good afternoon, and welcome to the Atlantic Council. Thanks very much for coming. I'm Steve Grundman. I'm the director. Thank you. <laughs> I'm the director of Emerging Defense Challenges here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, I'm also the producer of this Captains of Industry series, uh, which we have the pleasure today of hearing uh, Roger Crone, the chairman and chief executive officer of Lidos, uh, speak at. Add his name to a really distinguished uh, run of speakers in this Captains of Industry series. Um, he's going to make an address, and then we're going to have a discussion about his, how his company, Lidos, and the government services sector in general <clears throat> address the, uh, this is the mission statement of the series, address the public interests these companies serve, and contend with the public policies that shape the market. Thanks very much, Roger. Appreciate uh, you coming and participating in this series uh, and having a conversation with those of us here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, before we launch into the discussion, I'm compelled to make several administrative notes. First, uh, the agenda is pretty straightforward, but worth mentioning. Um, uh, during the first third of these 75 minutes, I will um, first invite Greg Dahlberg, a member of Lidos Board of Directors, a friend of the Council, and, uh, and as I say, a director at Lidos, um, who's going to make a proper introduction of, of Roger Crone. Uh, Roger then will deliver some prepared remarks, following which he and I will sit down, have a conversation, at the end of which, in the last third of the 75 minutes, we'll entertain uh, some questions here from the audience, and even uh, perhaps questions uh, over Twitter. We are live streaming the event, and those of you, uh, for that matter, even in the room, uh, let alone uh, those who might be watching over the live stream, can send questions in over Twitter, and our staff, uh, if they detect a good one, uh, will uh, slip me a piece of paper with a good question on it that I can pose to Roger, uh, even if you don't happen to be here in the room today. Um, second, uh, we should all understand this, is, uh, this event is entirely public and on the record. Uh, this fact holds the greatest significance, of course, for Roger. Uh, but at the same time, for the rest of you, uh, whom I may call on during the Q&A, I would ask you, therefore, to carefully identify yourself, wait for the microphone, carefully identify yourself and your affiliation before launching into your question. And then finally, uh, I've alluded to Twitter. Uh, we are tweeting at the hashtag AC Defense. Am I right about that? Okay. We're t uh, tweeting the event at the hashtag AC Defense. Uh, finally, the event will need to conclude at 545. So what I would ask, you know, as we're approaching that uh, threshold, I would ask uh, those of you who are working with me on Q&A uh, to uh, help me work at a pace that gets us to a on-time ending. Today's event marks, uh, I believe, by my count, the 17th event in this series, uh, the purpose of which, uh, I've said, is to make available what I, uh, I'll admit is immodestly, I immodestly regard as the town's preeminent platform from which senior executives whose businesses address aerospace defense and government services can address, here's that mission statement, the public interests their companies serve and the public policies that shape these markets. Uh, I uh, want to mention that among the very first speakers, first people who accepted my invitation uh, to speak in this series was uh, Roger's, pre Roger's predecessor, uh, General John Jumper, who uh, uh, back at the time in early 2014, uh, as I recall the date, uh, was uh, uh, within his last few months of service as the Chief Executive Officer of Lidos, uh, just a couple months before uh, Roger came aboard as the Chief Executive Officer. The particular impetus for my inviting Roger to appear here uh, is, is multifold, but it's at least the following. Uh, the dynamism among companies in the government services sector, uh, at least as it strikes me, and my interest uh, as part of the service of this series uh, to get a uh, really prominent and thoughtful voice on that dynamism to come and address the, uh, the audience in this series. Um, Lidos is quite in the thick of that, that dynamism. Uh, these are firms, Lidos uh, may be most prominent among them, who are at the forefront of initiatives to bring digital transformation to government operations. Um, in turn, the sector is enjoying renewed growth of sales and value following a downdraft of several years after the end of the Iraq War and the peak of defense spending in 2010. Uh, accordingly, that growth is attracting entry by new firms, many with provenance in the commercial sector, uh, which are conceiving new products and services to address these changing tastes and preferences of government customers. Not least, um, and newsworthy these days, there is a vigorous restructuring of the sector underway among the established firms, uh, one which was given impetus in 2016, I think it must be said by Lidos' own acquisition of Lockheed Martin's information systems and global solutions business segment, about which I'm sure uh, Roger will speak more uh, presently. Um, finally, this dynamism, as I keep uh, alluding, uh, is abetted by the customer uh, itself, by government itself, whose influence 
uh, manifests itself both in the form of buying things, but also uh, in the form of its role as regulator of uh, how uh, uh, goods and especially in this case services get bought uh, by the government in this market. Well, that's as much as I was going to say by way of predicate. Um, I now want to introduce Greg Dahlberg um, so that he can come and, and give us a proper introduction to Roger Crone. Uh, Greg is currently the president and founder of Dahlberg Strategic, a, pro a professional services firm that gives guidance and advice to corporations, countries, and organizations doing business in Washington. Uh, Greg brings to that work more many years of background serving at senior levels, uh, um, most notably in the House Appropriations Committee uh, at the aforementioned Lockheed Martin Corporation. Uh, where he directed government affairs for many years, and in that capacity also, I, I don't mind mentioning, and proudly so, was on the board of directors here at the Atlanta Council. Welcome back, Greg. Uh, but also in the executive branch, where, among other things, he served as both the Undersecretary of the Army and later the Acting Secretary of the Army. Greg, thank you for coming, uh, and we'll proceed. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Thanks for those remarks, uh, Steve. And, and you know, as a former board member at the Atlantic Council, I, I have to say uh, the work you do, uh, I know firsthand, is really important for our country and, frankly, for, for democracy, Western democracy. And appreciate everything you do at the uh, Atlantic Council. Appreciate it very much. <clears throat> well, hey, you know, if you're kind of like me and you get up in the morning to go to work, you probably turn on television and uh, check out what's going on in, in the world. and. If you're also like me, you're getting a little tired of the harangues you hear on the, the news shows. And what I've done is kind of moved to the business channels a little bit. And if, and if you're like me also, you'll notice business channels have a lot of interviews with uh, <clears throat> CEOs in particular. So it's kind of interesting. Um, you'll see incredible, incre incredibly accomplished people. Uh, I, I know one of the best interviews I saw was a guy who reinvented the coffee shop internationally. Uh, obviously, that's Starbucks. Uh, uh, athletic shoe CEOs, athletic wear railroads, um, <clears throat> soft drink makers, uh, restaurant chains, just to name a few. And all of them are incredibly uh, talented people. You can tell. They've done, uh, right out of the textbook, have done really amazing things. They've optimized their supply chains. They've raised and deployed capital with precision and <clears throat> they've been masterful at innovating in their product lines, top-notch marketing for sure, and they've improved their uh, production efficiency. That's all kind of out of the MBA textbook, and they've um, taken that to a fine art, done really well with it. And if you ever hear someone like Kramer talk, he'll tell you how smart and incredibly you know, innovative these folks are, which they are for sure. But you know, having been <clears throat> in in and around the C-suite uh, of a big defense corporation for about thir 13 years. Um, whenever I, I watch these uh, interviews with these folks, I go, you know, to, oh, to have such a simple environment to live in that these folks have. All they have to worry about is, you know, the, it's too simplistic for sure, but the color of the next, you know, athletic shoe or what kind of recipe I'm going to have for my Starbucks coffee and how we're going to turn that into uh, more customers. All very important, and I'm not, not saying it's easy to do. But when you compare it to um, the environment that the folks in um, <clears throat> the, what I will call the defense security, the IT solutions sector that sells to the federal government, uh, the environment is frankly simple, simplistic. Um, just think about it for a minute, uh, and I know many of you already know this, but you know, not only do you have to run a top-notch uh, organization with uh, marketing and capital deployment and all the things that we talked about, but you know, every year uh, you have a budget, your, your whole program and the revenues that you derive are passed on by uh, budgets that start with the military services in the case of defense. They go to OSD, the Department of Defense for review and change. They go to OMB, and they go to Congress. They may or may not come out of that process, and it can be changed drastically. It's just one example, but <clears throat> uh, not many other sectors of uh, you know, our business environment really have to go through uh, that kind of ordeal each and every year. Um, you got political dysfunction in Congress, as we all know. 
uh, gridlock, CRs, sequestration, all meaning you have to be nimble on your, on your toes and be able to change and be flexible and adaptable uh, at almost lightning speed to be successful in this sector. Um, you have an alphabet soup of agencies out there who review your work, GAO, CRS, um, CAPE, um, IOT&E, uh, RAND, you know, there are FFRDCs, there's all kinds of folks out there which um, can and do decide to uh, take on, take a look at your program for good or for ill. Um, and you don't know, sometimes these folks are very knowledgeable people that know what they're doing. Sometimes they're more generalists who don't quite understand the technical aspects of what they're reviewing. So there's a lot of risk there. Um, press attention, uh, I, I'd argue that the press attention in this sector on for program performance is probably uh, higher and deeper than probably any other sector that I know. Well, you could probably argue that a little bit. Think tanks out there, second guessing the policies that you're trying to implement, uh, like, gee, Atlantic Council, uh, but uh, many, uh, many folks out there taking, um, taking a look at what you're doing, at what, what your program, how you're performing. Um, <clears throat> and you have customer set. Let's take DOD again. Um, you have military, a military that rotates as a matter of policy. So you have folks coming and going in the different programs periodically. Uh, it's a good thing, frankly, for the military. But uh, if you're trying to manage in this environment to see the changes of folks coming and going can change a lot. Uh, you have civilian political appointees who probably, um, <clears throat> I think the last I heard was like 18 month cycle for an average cycle of a political appointee, but you have incredible churn by uh, those folks too. And every time you have a change, you have uh, potentially, you know, a, a policy uh, change a policy, uh, a priority that might uh, go up or down, depending, and you've got to adapt to that. That's incredible. Uh, and then you have to build your pro you have to design products and services that don't fail. Um, <clears throat> these are, this is to the, again, to the military or for air traffic control or even the Social Security Administration putting out checks to people. These things cannot fail. Uh, so you, you have an incredibly dynamic, difficult environment to deal with. And I think um, that's kind of, I, I hate to say it, but I think it's under underappreciated as to how um, difficult it is and how when people are really successful at this, how it's world-class success. This is, this is not to be treated lightly. So in short, I, I'd say it takes kind of a special breed of cat to kind of successfully run a, uh, <clears throat> a business, especially a large or medium-sized business, um, in this sector and to do it, um, do it uh, well. And I think um, we have one right here today in uh, Roger Crone. Now Roger um, does understand the complex relationships between government and industry. And his, you know, his perspective is uh, based on 30 years of experience in the industry. Uh, he started the old fashioned way, which I really re like and respect, which is, you know, coming up from, I hate to say the bottom, but certainly uh, <clears throat> he knows the business from um, uh, 30 years of different experiences in the engineering field and in the finance field and in the st uh, strategic planning field. Roger was, uh, has a bachelor's degree from Georgia uh, Tech in aerospace engineering. Didn't stop there for sure. He had a master's degree from Texas Arlington in aerospace engineering. Then he just decided to go on and get an MBA from Harvard Business School. And then in the spare time, he became a pilot. And then I got a CPA um, certification, I guess you call that, on top of that. <clears throat> he started out uh, General Dynamics. Um, I think F F-16 was one of the big programs you were early in on. And uh, moved on to McDonnell Douglas where he kind of moved into the financial world a little bit and the planning, uh, moved up in McDonnell Douglas to be treasurer of, of that organization. And of course, as we all know, they combined with Boeing. And at Boeing, he kept moving up and onward and upward uh, into uh, areas of 
increasing responsibility. Uh, <clears throat> ended up um, as president of Network and Space Systems Division, which is 15,000 person division, which is kind of the very high tech uh, uh, part of the Boeing military program and space systems in particular, as well as chairman of the board of the ULA, United Launch Alliance, which is a 50-50 joint venture between uh, Lockheed Martin and uh, Boeing. Um, <clears throat> and then very fortunately for uh, Lido shareholders in 2014, uh, Roger uh, joined uh, the corporation as chairman and CEO. And almost immediately, he embarked on a journey leading the company through its uh, transformative acquisition of Lockheed Martin's former IS and GS business in 2016. Um, that combination doubled the company's size and revenues, and it stands today at about 10 plus billion dollars and 31,000 employees. Um, and Lidus is now the largest IT solutions provider to the federal government. So it's <clears throat> a nice little run for Lidos. Um, I've worked directly with Lidos as a member of the board of directors and can say it's been personally energizing to work with him in reviewing and affirming the strategic direction of Lidos. Um, the company is um, on the move, no doubt about it, and um, it's, it's had, uh, it's digested well this combination, which is a uh, when you work on it firsthand, you realize the immense um, amount of work it takes to get this kind of a combination accomplished with 50-50 new systems where you got to get everybody on the same page, culture's got to get uh, tuned up right, um, and you got to do this by while still delivering uh, excellent performance on your contracts and also winning new business at the same time. It's quite uh, an undertaking, and I got to say it was done me, uh, just incredibly well, and um, not, not many hiccups at all. Uh, the company's now pretty well digested, I, I'd say, if that's a term of art, uh, and they are now really uh, re revving up for the future, and I think it's going to be a very bright future for Lidos. So please join me in welcoming our guest speaker today, Mr. Roger Crone. We're going to start a coffee company. <laughs> uh, to have a single product company, so that would be great. Anyway, thank you, Greg, and uh, thank you, Steve, and thanks everybody else for coming here today. Um, I'll, uh, I've got some prepared remarks. I'll try to move relatively quickly through those, although they, they are lengthy because I anticipated, given what's been going on in our space lately, a bunch of questions. So I tried to address those and then. We'll have some time for questions. So, uh, anyway, it's great to be here, and of course, the Atlantic Council continues to do really important work. You know, one of the sayings of the Atlantic Council is, "We are stronger with allies," right? And I certainly join you in recognizing the bond and shared responsibility for security you have with our allies, certainly those that surround the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, in fact, Lidos is a partner in that effort, working with many international customers. Few people know about some of Lido's most interesting work, like the work that we are doing at NATO. Uh, our latest project was to architect and install the IT network in the new NATO headquarters building. Uh, we just achieved full operational capability a couple weeks ago, and the member nations and the staff are now in the process of relocating across the street. Those of you who are familiar with where the new headquarters is and where the old headquarters was. Uh, anyway, but this work uh, with the NATO IT network complements our traditional NATO work in the area of security, mostly based around uh, missile defense for continental Europe. One of the greatest things about being the CEO of a company like Lidos is always being amazed by the work of the 31,000 engineers, scientists, and experts who work there and of course, it's a privilege today for me to represent them in this forum. Now, over the past few weeks, there's been a lot of movement in the federal contracting space. And that's in addition to what's been taking place, frankly, over the last few months and really over the last few years. So I want to take a few moments here this afternoon at the outset to share a couple observations on what's going on and, more importantly, what's been driving 
these market dynamics. The first observation almost goes without saying, right? But it's so foundational in its effect on the market. It's that we live in an uncertain, dangerous, and evolving world that is becoming more digital and more connected at ever increasing speeds. Where we used to focus on just one or two areas of the world, we have now evolved to where there are at least six administration priorities and the return of not just a bipolar world, uh, but in many publications, more of a tripolar world. In addition, the evolution in technology is having a major impact on our customers. They're feeling the pressure to modernize, dry ever increasing efficiencies, and, occur, and secure their aging IT environments from an emerging virtual threat. Moore's Law, Metcalf's Law, the low cost of storage, the move to virtualization are all pacing a rate of change in our world that even the most large organizations are challenged to keep up with. As a result, what customers want from companies like Lidos is changing. Services are not enough. It's not just labor as an extension of the customer. Our industry is changing to highly skilled labor, solving customer problems, and supporting customer mission. This is increased demand for IT modernization, cyber, and advanced machine capabilities leads to a second observation. Government IT is a hot place to be right now. The addressable markets which in the government IT space have grown with the recent activity on the Hill with the fiscal year 18 omnibus. DOD's funding is $654 billion, which represents the largest increase in our armed forces since the beginning of the war on terror. In terms of civil markets, somewhat thanks to the sequester and its budget cap mechanism, the CBO office shows non-defense appropriations at nearly $580 billion for fiscal year 18, an increase of 10% compared to fiscal year 17. That's a combined increase across the board of over a trillion dollars in spend. It's also encouraging to see that across the entire federal budget, public analysis puts total fiscal year 18 R&D funding up 20 billion from fiscal year 17 allocation. This increase in domestic spending includes focus and spending on IT infrastructure. President Trump codified the Modernizing Government Technology Act in December when he signed the 2018 National Defense Authorization Act. The Technology Modernization Fund has $100 million for its first six months, and estimates show roughly $2 billion for various IT modernization projects across the omnibus spending bill. Whichever numbers you look at, just about any way you want to slice them, the newly approved omnibus is a positive sign for federal contractors. And I'm reasonably confident that the 2019 numbers will also be in line with those of 2018. Aside from the new budget, these markets are also attractive because of the increasing focus on collaboration with the government. This administration has reached out to industry and dialogue and wants to see interaction with contractors of all backgrounds. Most recently, Defense, Deputy Defense Secretary Pat Shanahan, I gave Pat a promotion there, uh, encouraged Pentagon military and civilian leaders to optimize relationships with industry to drive higher performance, saying, and I quote, Industry is often the best source of information concerning market conditions and technological capabilities. This information is crucial to determining whether and how the industry can support the department's missions and goals. He went on to debunk seven myths about dealing with industry. Now the myth I especially like was number four. Industry's interests are diametrically opposed to government interests. We who work in the field know that this is flatly not true. 25% of our team used to wear the uniform, and another 10% of our team used to be civilian employees of government agencies. In this industry, our days begin and our days end being completely aligned with our customer's mission. Most government contractors I know view working in this industry as a source of pride and patriotism. 
A final catalyst for doing business in the federal space goes back to January with the national defense strategy shared by Secretary of Defense Mattis. He outlines areas where he wants to drive investment and subsequently where industry should invest. The new technologies the Defense Department will need are advanced computing, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, autonomy, robotics, directed energy, hypersonics, and biotechnology. Secretary Mattis is taking the extraordinary step of meeting with us tomorrow to discuss his strategy. At Lidos, we were very encouraged when we saw that list. Seven out of eight areas are where our investments are already being made. In addition, the strategy also emphasizes investments in readiness and modernization, particularly in domains like space and cyber, where LIDOS technologies and expertise are also strong. So it's no surprise that interest is focused on the marketplace in which we operate. An increasing hostile and diverse world, technological changes, budget increases, customers with needs to respond outside their organic ability, and focus on new, dare I say, third offset battle space areas, all drive focus in areas where Lidos plays. Now a bit more about the company named Lidos. So Lidos is a comparatively new name in the marketplace, but of course we are not a new company. It was almost four years to the day, Steve, when my predecessor and friend, then Lido CEO, General John Jumper, spoke to this very group about the new name and the new company. Lidos, changing from an older name in SAIC and spinning out our systems engineering and technical assistance business, drove a new path for differentiated and value-added services and solutions in the defense business. I took over from John in July of 2014, and, and we, like everyone else, saw technology evolving and infiltrating our lives and our work at a faster pace than many of our customers could acquire and deploy in service of their missions. Stagnant budgets during the past decades freeze on government hiring also seem to exacerbate, exacerbate the problem. We saw a government IT market that would require not only constant maintenance of customer systems, but also creating a path for constant transformation so our customers could remain relevant with these new emerging technologies. Thanks to the direction laid down by John and others, we were already headed down a strong strategic path by separating from our CETA work and the organizational conflict of interest that comes with it. We believe we're well positioned because as a company, we are just fundamentally different. We view ourselves as having technological differentiators that drive a unique view of the marketplace. I mentioned that Lidos is not a new company, just a new name. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary next year, so we also have the advantage of 50 years of customer relationships, innovation, and execution. Lidos, or SAC, has always grown as a combination of organic and inorganic growth. In fact, many of our acquisitions have gone on to be freestanding spin-outs from Lidos, like Network Solutions and Telcordia. We've added to this leg legacy of inorganic growth through M&A when we acquired Lockheed Martin's former IS and GS business about two years ago. We had four main objectives in that transaction. The first was to improve our position in the attractive and growing government IT markets. Second was to improve our financial profile. The third objective was to expand our scale and diversity of our contract portfolio. And finally, we wanted to strengthen our core capabilities. So I've already talked about what's going on in the markets, but of course, when we decided to do the deal, we didn't know what the outcome of the presidential elections would be when we completed the deal in August of 2016. But I would only comment that our post-merger position in the market turned out to be an even better decision after, after the Republican win in November of 16. The reverse Morris Trust deal structure 
allowed us to use our equity for a portion of the deal proceeds. This left us with a much stronger balance sheet post-closing and one with minimal leverage. Leverage today that is below three times debt to EBITDA. This gives us financial options on how to deploy our free cash that our low asset business model generates. Recently, the discussion of scale has once again become topical. Scale matters for a number of reasons, but not for the sake of scale itself. There are some obvious ones, like spreading corporate overhead across more cost base to drive better wrap rates that lead to more competitive pricing. That's an advantage that comes with scale, but for us, it definitely wasn't the primary or sole driver for the deal. We're just not an LPTA type of company, although cost nowadays is always considered a competitive factor. Just as important though, scale broadens the portfolio of contract vehicles and customer relationships. Just like we had great relationships with customers as pre-merger Lidos, we gained additional relationships through the acquisition, some dating back to the origination of that agency. This allows us to sell our technological capabilities to new customers and in new markets. Cross-selling is one of those post-merger integration abilities that drives our growth. This also helps to de-risk the portfolio and provide customer budget and regional diversity. Finally, scale increases what we have at our disposal in the way of discretionary spending. Think of this in two buckets, brand and present in the market and the support of R&D spending to continue our differentiation in the marketplace. At Lidos, we're still building a strong brand after the name change and that takes time and investment, even under normal market conditions. Being number one in federal IT helps us to get recognized. Most of what we do, we do through people. A strong brand is essential to attract and retain the talent that we need, and we're seeing the benefits of our investments there every day. The other discretionary investment area, bolstered by scale, is research and development which allows me to talk about how the final main objective of the 2016 transaction uh, is materializing. In the deal, we expanded our core capabilities through scale, and we're now able to invest even more to strengthen that expanding set of capabilities. We spend our company-sponsored R&D to develop differentiating intellectual property that serves as the seed corn for penetration and growth in involving markets to meet customer needs. Machine learning, blockchain, and quantum computing are all examples of this spend. Our ability to pursue and to be successful at contract R&D is what I believe sets us apart in many ways. We have world-class people to develop R&D solutions under contracts with customers like DARPA, AFRL, and ONR that complement our internal IRAD spend and leverage our R&D portfolio writ large. We believe so much in this approach that we stood up a business within our company, the Advanced Solutions Group, to serve as a P&L center, but also to serve as an innovation incubator. They are positioned to create and to create and stretch solutions into evolving markets, whether for battlefield logistics, health and hospital work, or civil infrastructure. We are also a bridge builder between the government, commercial sectors, and academia. For example, our largest supply partner is Dell EMC. So in a future that requires companies and governments to embrace innovation wherever it comes from, we like our position as a conduit between these worlds. We at Lidos like the market we are in and the company we have created. While the future presents us with a lot of uncertainty, we do believe there are some things in the short term we can anticipate. We expect consolidation will continue in the federal services market and that we will continue to maintain a leadership position 
regardless of what spot we occupy on any list. I have always believed you could pick any set of metrics you wanted, slice the numbers in different ways, and you could place several companies at the top of any list. So I would be happy for us to be a scrappy number two in any market in which we compete. In fact, I challenge my team not to see traditional companies as our competitors. I tell them to look at AECOM, HPE, and IBM as our competitors as well. So we're not simply going to stay our own course. It's my job to keep the team focused on our four strategic pillars, executing to our commitments, differentiating Lidos from our competitors, growing the business, and energizing our talented team. We believe our long-term success depends upon these factors. In closing today, I want to share with you one final topic, one that I'm personally passionate about, that's leveraging technology for a safer, healthier world. As I'm sure you've read in the news, we are facing the worst drug crisis in U.S. history, affecting both our civilians and military personnel. More Americans will die from drug overdose, overdose this year alone than the number of U.S. soldiers lost in Vietnam, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and During Freedom combined. If that alone is not compelling, there is also the fact that the CDC estimates that the opioid epidemic costs our country approximately $500 billion a year. So why do I bring this up at a forum like this? First, I'm thrilled to see the inclusion of nearly $4 billion of funding in the fiscal year 18 budget to combat this crisis through awareness, treatment, and prevention efforts. But I also believe that industry yields considerable strength in doing something about this issue. It's our collective responsibility to serve our communities. From offering forums within our organizations to raise awareness and provide help to employees, to sponsoring charitable programs and partnering with academia to ensure we are reinforcing the right messages in our school systems. We must all get involved in order to provoke behavioral change. So today, I want to use this forum to challenge all of us to think about how we can use our collective brain power, entrepreneurship, innovation, and influence to present new ideas, policy, and technology that can make a difference in this fight against opioid epidemic. Again, thank you for being here this afternoon. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to address you. I thank you for your time and attention. And now Steve will take some questions. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. That's terrific. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly uh, what we're looking for at the Captains of Industry. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate it very much. I know the audience uh, does as well. Um, we're going to spend the remainder of about a half hour that we have here split between my uh, indulging my uh, further curiosity, mostly about stuff you already talked about okay. there, but to grab some of those threads and, sure. and pull them a little farther, and, uh, and then to take uh, questions from those of you here, here in the audience uh, in respect to uh, the things that Roger had to say, or maybe things you didn't, that he didn't have to say that you're curious about. Um, but I, I wanted to start with you. Uh, so Greg uh, gave a thumbnail sketch of your professional biography, but I'm interested. I ask all of our captains of industry to give us a sense of kind of your origin story in aerospace and defense. Mm -hmm. well, why you were a very talented young man. Why did you orient on aerospace, defense, and what's now come to be government services as opposed to whatever else you might have done? Yeah, well, great. I appreciate that. That's a great first question. It's a lot easier than I thought it would be. Um, well, you know, uh, my dad was a uh, bombardier in World War II. We okay. flew in B-29s, uh, went to law school on the GI Bill, and grew up in Cincinnati. And while he was uh, studying to be a lawyer, he would take us to the airport in Cincinnati called Lunkin, Sunken Lunkin. And mm -hmm. he would work on his you know, law studies, and we would play on the playground at the end of the runway. And, you know, I already had all his World War II gear, his oxygen mask and his flight jacket and all of that. And mm -hmm. we would run around the airport and, um, you know, that was about the time of Sputnik and, you know, the, the, the race to the moon. And, sure. you know, I just, um, you know, I, I got bit and it just hung on. It's interesting, I have uh, two brothers and a sister. Of course, none of them are in the industry. But didn't bite everybody. They didn't bite everybody. But for me, it just, it was, it was what was, we call the IOT, you know, back then, it's what 
was mm -hmm. the cutting edge and it seemed exciting and the moon and flying and being an aerospace engineer, which really yeah. scared my mother because when I went to school, uh, you know, that's about the time that uh, a big company in the Seattle region you know, uh, is known for a bulletin board that said something about last one out, turn off the lights. Oh, right. So when I was going to school, you know, most aerospace engineers were doing something other than aerospace engineering, but mm. it's what I wanted to do. And I got in at the right time, I think. And uh, by the time I got out, um, 1978, uh, by the way, my first airplane was the 111. Okay. It dates me a little bit. Um, there were at uh, GD Fort Worth. At GD Fort Worth, mm -hmm. right, which is now Lockheed Fort right, Worth. Right, right. Yep. But I got to legendary work on plants the, where the F-35 yeah, is being built. Yeah, I got to work on the F-111. I was started literally on the drafting board. I mean, I I tell my kids this. I mean, I took a course in college where they teach you how to pick different hardness of pencils, and then you go and you have paper and you have this 10-foot drawing board and they issue you this mechanical equipment called a T-square and no, no you CAD have compasses and things and. You know, you spend your first year or two on the board, literally, actually uh, drawing parts yeah. of the F-111, and then finally the F-16. But that's it's kind of how it all started, and I've had the great fortune to be in the industry uh, pretty much nonstop ever since. Yeah. Okay. Well, a uh, a, a child of Sputnik, if 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 I may, uh, um, roughly. I hope you, that doesn't you, sound like first, it's dating you. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, you're certainly um, welcome. So let me that. let me hang on to that thread uh, and make a, a jump sort of from you to, to Lidos and, and ask you to talk about a distinction which those of us uh, observers, maybe students of, of the industry often um, uh, uh, reflect upon, and that is the difference between the hardware uh, business of aerospace defense and government services and services. So you've made the leap um, from as hardware a hardware company as there could have been. Um, I suppose the network and, and uh, space yeah. systems business had some of the IT in it, but what I want to know is, um, how different? Was there a big adaptation that was required to come run a big services company, or is that just something we, outside the industry, uh, teach ourselves? Um, I, I'll, I'll make two points. Uh, the first one, I think, will address your point, but coming to Lidos, sure. there's a second point that is probably more of a change. So first of all, I think everyone in the space has a continuum between platforms and services. I mean, even the large services companies um, and even Lockheed now, post IS and GS, still provides service after the sale from an OEM standpoint. Mm -hmm. So um, our customers demand that we support the products over the life cycle. And, and at Lidos, we actually, we actually uh, modify airplanes and deliver mm -hmm. uh, full up aircraft under programs of record. We have a program called uh, Airborne Reconnaissance Light yep. Enhanced for yep. the Army which is their ISR program of record. Uh, Lidos has more work that is done by people and less that is done in factories. So you, you actually, you pick up some of this just being in the industry. But, it, um, but it's, not, it's not alien to hardware. It's, no, you're, you're in, and we have five or six <clears throat> smaller factories. Most of what we do, we either do, we have aircraft mods, we do that kind of work. We have some electronic factories where we assemble radios and other, um, sensors, detection equipment, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of factories actually in the Washington DC area. Um, so, so it's a matter of degree, uh, but it does, it does require a different set of skills. Uh, the people, the people are important everywhere, and, uh, but they are the center of what we do at Lidos. I would describe the transition from, so I was at GD, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, you know, was close to Lockheed. I was actually not there mm. when we sold the Fort Worth division mm -hmm. to Lockheed, although many of my friends were. The biggest, I think, change going to Lidos really goes back to the heritage of Bob Beister and it the, having uh, been a company. The audience, the legendary the, So chairman. Bob Bob was the founder of the company called SAI right. in 1969, and, mm -hmm. and Bob had left a company called General Atomics that at that time did general atomic work mm -hmm. instead of making um, uh, RPVs or drones, and Bob left because he was looking for a different governance model, and the company SAI, eventually renamed SAIC, and now renamed Lidos, uh, was employee-owned. And we mm -hmm. were employee-owned pretty much through 2006, 2009 time frame, different classes of stock could trade out at different times. And so the Different, I think, than almost any company you would see in our space. We still have 
the view of employees being owners and being empowered. And I like to say, um, I have 32,000 or 31,000 bosses. Mm -hmm. And many, many people at the company still view the CEO role in that way, as you know, someone uh, who is there to provide you know, resources and you know, a bit of strategic direction, but the work and the ownership really owned by the line and uh, the people who've been with the company a long time. And, and that is different. Um, and I was fortunate enough to transition from a large aerospace company to Lidos at a time in my life and my career where making them successful, making the company successful was probably the most important part of my role. Okay, but managing um, to outputs that one might call solutions rather than pieces of hardware is not that sharply different a managerial task is what I think I'm hearing you say. Uh, it, it, <clears throat> is, uh, it is across a continuum. Okay, yeah. I, uh, so I ran a helicopter factory in Philadelphia. I had a UAW union. You know, how I came to work, uh, what I did at 6.30 in the morning was very different. Mm -hmm. At 6.30 in the morning in the helicopter plant, I'd walk the floor, I'd talk to the union stewards, I'd talk to the president of the union, but it's a people job. Mm -hmm. And different kind of people, different value stream. But at, you know, I would tell you at, at the level that I'm working today and most other you know, senior executives in the industry, I mean, they don't let me do engineering anymore. Mostly what I do is I work with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Lidos, it's just ever more that important that I'm able to connect with people and, and allow people to know you know how important they are in the company, and that you know we care about their future and and their career, and frankly their families and the communities in which they operate. Okay, uh, another question about Lidos, but sort of that makes the transition to a little discussion about the market, and then ultimately the the government customer. Um, and it's this: I think maybe not unique among the American government services contractors, but distinctively so. Um, you've made a thrust uh, to be a global company, particularly in Europe. Um, uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk about that as, as a strategic choice, because it obviously required investment. And then maybe in particular, um, if you could give us the example of the big services contract you have with the UK Ministry of Defense, yeah, no, I'll be happy to again to help that. elucidate right. what does this company do? Yeah, so we're about 10% of our revenue is generated by a source outside uh, the US government, mm -hmm. or outside the US. You mentioned the NATO contract yeah, already. The, the NATO contract yeah. is, is <clears throat> part of that. We probably have another Oh, maybe almost 10% of our activity that we do around the world, but it's funded by a U.S. contract, okay. right? So it, it might be, um, we have the Afghan CLS program. So we have 300 contract plus. Contract logistics support. Right. We have 300 plus people in Afghanistan. That is an army contract. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when, when so, Bob Beister added the C to SAIC, mm -hmm. that was because the I changed from incorporated to international. And so there's really actually a fairly long legacy at the company of wanting to do work you know, overseas that um, was in line with our strategic goals and objectives. And so what we try to do is the same type of work in the UK, in continental Europe, in the Mideast, and in Australia, which are four uh, large markets uh, that we do here. Now, what is different, I know you asked me some questions about the large aerospace prime. Where it is most different, by the way, at Lidos, <clears throat> is in my lifetime, I was on the F-16 program, as you mentioned, we built the F-16 in Fort Worth. We DD-250'd it at the end of the runway, and we flew it to mm -hmm. any one of the EPG countries. Our international model at Lidos is very different. Uh, we have a very light... Uh, U.S. presence, what we call expatriates, who are living overseas, and we hire and develop our capability locally. Okay. So our program in the U.K., where we have essentially um, um, privatized the uh, support, in fact, the whole value stream, the it's a huge demand, contract. it's a huge contract. It's a 10-year in the tens of billions of dollars. Um, it's not quite uh, if you can think about outsourcing DLA, but it's some components of that. So outsourcing dis, uh, defense logistics, defense agency logistics activities. Agency. Sorry, yep. I'll, I'll try. It's to, okay. I'm, try my to job is to, to make sure we're all on track. Uh, but we run the program from demand generation, order entry, buying, warehousing, 
distributing and to the extent that we do pre-positioning, we do war readiness, and then retrograde. So that's for um, all of the classes of spares for the UK that would be considered commodities. Now, you know, you, you might think of commodities as, you know, like, uh, like boots, but it really goes much beyond that. We do some petroleum oil and lubricants. We do certain weapons and ammunition. Um, we do some foodstuffs, but we also do commodity parts. So those would be uh, fasteners, tires, tools, and things like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's a huge program for us that we won competitively. We're teamed with some international partners. Kuna Nagel, who is a warehousing company, and TVS, who helps us to do the ordering. But we took over, it's kind of like an A76 program over here, yep. and I won't even try to explain that it's to okay. people who don't know what that is. Um, but we, uh, we took over the employee group uh, in the UK. The government, the, the right. Ministry of Defense's right. own employees. That were part of a government union mm -hmm. and uh, brought them into Lidos and then supplemented that with some logistics experts that we had here. And then we teamed with uh, the various companies, uh, Kunanago and TVS. And uh, we actually built about a million square feet of warehouse. We've consolidated what really were World War II era mm -hmm. uh, facilities, and uh, we rebuilt the IT system. So we like it because it was, it was not, <clears throat> if you think about it as a business process outsourcing, which is something we would not be interested in, it really was a transformation of the logistics value stream for uh, the UK MOD. And we got to apply a lot of added value in the way, um, in the, way the government uh, manages demand across the uh, the commodities. In fact, our contract is actually a gain share. Is there a performance, is there yeah, a performance there is, dimension to it? We get a, a management fee base, which is relatively small, and then we get a percentage of the share in the savings. Mm -hmm. And um, we've had the contract now probably about three, three and a half years, and there has been significant savings. And there will be more savings in the future as we bring more commodity units into the into the program. Okay, well, I could pull on that thread for a while, but I'll move on to uh, another subject uh, that I alluded to in my introductory remarks and you touched upon, and that is um, uh, particularly when you, you referenced uh, companies you regard as competitors that we in government services might not typically think of, AECOM, uh, IBM, uh, H, uh, the Hewlett Packard. Uh, HPE. HPE. Um, uh, one of the enduring themes of the Captains of Industry series has been the the in, in, introduction and, and just plain outright competition from commercial vendors, the introduction of commercial technologies into solving government's right. problems. Um, is that a, a threat, opportunity, uh, or otherwise yeah. for Lidos? Right. Well, yeah, uh, commercial, I, commercial yeah, technologies and say, commercial competition. Steve, you almost know the answer, right? Okay, I mean, sorry. It's, it's all of the above, mm -hmm. right? And, and well, Then um, give us some examples well, of we, how this plays well, out. It, it's, We've invented a term for it. You know, we call them competimates. Competimates, That's right? So, um, on any given day, we'll take IBM because you know everybody understands IBM. Uh, IBM is on my team. Uh, uh, I'm on their team in some uh, uh, places. I have competed with IBM for pro on programs, the large uh, defense health agency electronic healthcare records program mm -hmm. that we won with Cerner, which is part of bringing that commercial. Capability with, through with who'd you win with? Cerner. Cerner. Cerner is a electronic healthcare uh, records company that mm -hmm. has essentially think of it as a COTS, EHR, EMR uh, software package based in Kansas City. Okay. M people might be more familiar with like Epic or Meditech or McKesson or Allscripts. Well, Cerner is okay. in that ilk, <clears throat> and we competed with IBM uh, to install new healthcare records system for all the active military. Mm -hmm. That's on one hand. On another hand, they're on my team in uh, going after some transformational uh, IT modernization programs within DOD. And on any given day, I find myself on their, their team uh, as well. We have one of our technical core uh, competencies we call uh, data analytics, uh, where, we, where we have a repository for the work we're doing in machine learning and AI and a lot of the words that have become quite popular mm -hmm. lately. Um, if we were IBM and maybe a bit more creative, we would call that technical core capability Watson. And so yeah. we actually, in many ways, have duplicated some of the capabilities that IBM touts as Watson, 
which is really around machine learning and machine analytics. So mm -hmm. on any given day, we're teaming with these companies, but we will also find themselves on uh, the other side of the competition table. Um, you, you enumerated the, uh, the, the, the technologies which the National Defense Strategy and the third offset before that yeah. um, uh, enunciated would uh, transform and challenge um, our, our defense establishment. Um, if you're going to pick one or two of those out where the establishment defense industry really needs to go get from commercial uh, technology uh, their solutions, are, are there some that stand out where um, we, we well, are yeah, more there challenged is, there are. as traditionalists uh, than, than yeah, in yeah, other yeah, yeah. places? Okay, but the first thing I, w I will do is, is um, you know, kind of refer to uh, Mike Griffin, and yep. who uh, said it's... So the new undersecretary for uh, R&E, I think they're right, calling research right. and engineering. As we split what we would call the Frank Kendall job into mm -hmm. two positions, you know, Mike got up at a recent forum and said, you know, all this is important, but hypersonics is the number one. So I, I want Mike to know we heard him, uh -huh. right? And unfortunately, hypersonics is the one of the eight that, uh, from a Not LIDO standpoint, we don't, we don't do any hypersonics work yet. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we, we might get into it. Um, let's see, I, I, uh, if I, and we have actually prioritized those. It's this uh, around machine analytics, enterprise IT, and cyber. I mean, those are the okay. areas uh, where we have made our investments, where we see the rapid change, and frankly, we see the threat evolving at a rate uh, which will challenge us all. And the, 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 the threat to our national security, the, the, but remember, part of what I'm trying to find out is where do we need to reach over and, and engage the commercial sector oh, in order to get sector? these problems solved? Well, I, let's, let's see. You know, th those are clearly categories where there is a lot of capability in the commercial sector by way data analytics. Yeah. You know, we are actually in discussions with several companies who are just data analytics startups and mm -hmm. uh, trying to find a way to, as I said in the prepared remarks, to build that bridge between their entrepreneurial creativeness and our you know, relatively you know, federal acquisition reg um, yeah. um, a customer. And uh, you know, data analytics is a good one, but commercial cyber is another one. And you know, getting down a little deeper, we were talking about, you know, I, I mentioned um, you know, blockchain is sort of a hot word okay. right now. By the way, blockchain is important. From a commerce standpoint, it's also important to understand how blockchain works. Mm -hmm. um, from a cyber, from a cyber standpoint, there are always, you know, always two sides to every problem. Yeah. Okay. All right. My last question, and then I would invite and encourage uh, some questions from the audience, and and it's this: coming back to the budget, the big omnibus budget, uh, about 19. What's your outlook? Over yeah. A longer frame of time. Right. Well, I I kind of said as far as my headlights go, mm -hmm. right, and so you know we're. We're relatively pleased with 18. We think there is a big step up in spending. A lot of people are trying to obligate uh, their funds, even though we did get some relief to spend you know, O&M into 19. Because of all the things that are happening politically, we think 19 will look a lot like 18. Um, it would be interesting what happens in the midterm election, but um, we suspect, and I know we were debating before, that whether we'll actually get a authorizations and appropriations bill and get the president to sign it before everybody goes sure. out and runs for re-election. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd give it 50-50, which is actually a pretty high handicap given that, what, once out of the last 11 years we actually got bills on time. Uh, but we're hoping for that. But your question is really, what do I think beyond is that? Is this the beginning of yeah. a long up cycle uh, well, uh, in your outlook? Yeah. Um, well, of course, we always hope so, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, mm -hmm. There was a, a Joint Chief of Staff, I think, <clears throat> to JCS ago, when asked what is the largest threat to the nation, and uh, without quoting him directly, um, his comment was the size of the national debt. Mm -hmm. And there is just a point in time where the size of the national uh, debt drives up interest costs uh, absorbs capital in the world today, and that Venn diagram once again overlaps with uh, national security and the security of the nation. And so there is 
some upper limit right, to how much we can borrow um, and how much we can spend. And um, I think as we get into 20 and 21, we're going to have to think more fiscally conservative than we have been. And if we want to spend at the levels that we are now, we'll have to make some very difficult choices about spending uh, in other parts of the federal government. And I have not yet seen a Congress who's willing to make the trade. Right. You know, and to, if you will, guns for butter or however you want to refer to that. Mm -hmm. And so the prognosis for that is, um, you know, less of an increase. Uh, and in fact, you know, you could see probably flattening of budgets in that 20, 21, 22. Mm -hmm. Although the, you know, the POM and the EPP aren't yet indicating that, but I think there will be a point of uh, fiscal uh, uh, concern and that we will see this uh, bump up in spending. And by the way, if you add an infrastructure bill on top of it, it's, right. it's even going to be higher. And, and also, and, as uh, you may have alluded to, you know, who, who actually finances this debt um, is of strategic interest as well. Right, I suspect we'll get to that before um, the questions are over. All right, we are going to take some questions first from Michael Bruno and then from this gentleman here. Thank you, Michael Bruno with Aviation Week and Space Technology. You've talked in the past, I think, about the unmanned sea surface vehicle and going out and doing some experimenting using a shipyard to build it and moving on. And I'm curious, how much opportunity do you see in regards to building hardware as a non-traditional prime? Is it just picking up on occasional opportunity or is it a major growth sector? Um, well, let's see, and I've been asked by, you know, the Wall Street analysts, you know, product versus services, where are we in a mix? And I think we're on record of saying we'd like to be a little bit higher in products, but our, our business strategy is not to own a shipyard, not to own a rocket plant, not to own a satellite factory, um, but to own the intellectual property and the design and the value added that supports mission. And for many of you maybe didn't understand the question, we, we have built the first of a, what we hope to be a series, we're constructing the second about 130 foot autonomous surface ship, uh, which started as a DARPA program is transitioned to the <coughs> Office of Naval Research and it's out in sea trials um, in uh, Point Loma in San Diego. And to do that, we rented a shipyard because honestly there are lots of shipyards, both you know, uh, primarily government, but many commercial shipyards and you, know, you literally can rent a shipyard by employing the people who work in the shipyard. And we felt our business model of using the shipyard when we needed it and then turning back that capacity. Uh, we used the, it was uh, Oregon Iron Works, which has now been bought by Vigor uh, up in the Northwest. But uh, we're, for our <coughs> second haul, we're actually using a different shipyard uh, down in Mississippi which is uh, where one of our business units is headquartered near Gulfport. And so that made, made sense for us. And we, we like that model. Uh, even the factories that we have and um, uh, out by Dulles Airport, we have electronic fabrication facility, but we lease the factory. It's very light. Think about it as final assembly integration and test. I think across the company, we only have one or two wave soldering lines because you know, there's so much capacity in electronic uh, manufacturing where you can go out and get PC boards and, and boards built by contract le electronic manufacturers. We don't see a huge value add from Lidos in that part of manufacturing. We think the design and then final assembly integration test and frankly feeling support, et cetera, is um, where we can make a difference for the customer really, really different business model than a traditional um, hardware business model. Take this question here and then bring the microphone to that gentleman on the aisle, please. My name is Walter Jurassic. I'm a member of Atlantic Council. Uh, Mr. Roger, education. You mentioned education. United States is quite a bit behind many countries on education. I travel all over the country and sometimes I go to the ghettos called and there is a, so much hunger for education from the kids, which I already talked to them. They're interested in many things. They do not have an opportunity to grow because our system, something is wrong. For 20 something years, I see the same, same politicians only talk, talk, talk. They don't do nothing. 
what industry can do, what your company, for example, can do to improve the education system. And second question is, I didn't understand what you mean by cross-selling. What do you mean by oh. that? Um, okay, let's do the let's do the easy one. Cross-selling is uh, when Lidos had a capability that Lockheed's IS and GS didn't, but they had a customer for which we could sell that capability. So when we brought the two organizations together, we could now sell, um, well, I, think I can't do that without being classified, but we can now sell this thing to a customer that, uh, that the, well, a good one was, so heavy data analytics and LIDOS, um, IS and GS brought in air traffic control. So now we bring data analytics where we can analyze traffic flows as on our ERAM program, which handles most of the air traffic, uh, the en route air traffic in the US, we can bring data analytics to the ERAM contract. That's what we mean by cross-selling. And vice versa, there were some enterprise IT capabilities in the IS and GS business that came and now we can bid in markets uh, where we would not have had enterprise IT capability. That's what we mean by cross-selling. Uh, your, your point on education, first of all, let me agree with your premise, which is um, we, we have a demand and capacity issue within the US. Um, we don't have as many, and we're very much involved in science, technology, engineering, and math uh, graduates as, as we can hire. Um, at any given time within Lidos, we run a thousand plus open unfilled requisitions primarily people with electrical engineering, computer science degrees, data analytics, systems engineering, and might have a clearance of some kind, a lifestyle polygraph or uh, counterintelligence polygraph. And what, what we do is, what we do across our business writ large, we go find the educational institutions that we think are creating the, um, the educational product that we need and in the National Capital Region, there are five or six schools, and we create partnerships. We spend some of our R&D money. Uh, we donate to those schools. We hire their students as interns. Um, uh, we have a tuition reimbursement program at Lidos. If you come in full time, we will you know, share some of the expense of getting a master's degree. Um, so, but a lot of companies do that. I think we also you know, kind of use our our position as a company to talk to some of the leading engineering schools in the US about uh, what our demand is, what's important, what are the skills uh, that we're looking for in an attempt for them to kind of uh, hire faculty and increase the robustness of some of the programs uh, that, that we need and that we see demand for in the future. But I, but I'm about kids. Kids? Yeah. Uh, I, again, I don't want to go too far, but you know, first robotics. There's the TARP program, AIA with rockets, and um, we we do a lot of sponsorship at that level. But uh, um, I think in the U.S. we frankly don't have enough science, technology, engineering, and math kids uh, to meet the growing demand for for uh, the workers in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to take this last question right here. I'm afraid it's all we have time for. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. What kinds of things is Lidos doing in helping the client set up rational program priorities to set the objectives of the programs and assign weights to the objectives and score the candidate programs to find a prioritization? Program planning in the defense yeah. department, uh, if you will. Um, <clears throat> a, a great question. Let's see if I can uh, give you two answers. So. First and foremost, the work that you described, we might put that in the category of what we call systems engineering and technical assistance work, right? And LIDOS or SAIC used to be in that business in a significant way in the billions <coughs> of dollars. And they changed the federal acquisition reg about three and a half, four years ago. And when we separated out the company that now bears the name SAIC, that type of work moved to the company that now is called SAIC because the way the federal acquisition reg was written, 
if you provided that kind of assistance to customers, there's what we call the organizational conflict of interest clause, and uh, we found ourselves prohibited then if you had advised the customer on requirements and acquisition strategy, you were prohibited from bidding downstream subsequently on that work. And that was really the change in the federal acquisition reg that led us to spin out the CETA business under the name SAIC, but just in the same way that Lockheed Martin spun out part of Valley Forge under something called the SI, which is now Vencore, and Northrop Grumman uh, spun out a company called Task, which merged with L3's services industry into a company that's now called Angility. Uh, that being said, if you have listened to the conversations from Ellen Lord um, and Pat Shanahan, it is important for us to continue to communicate to our customers the art of the possible and not <clears throat> end up um, with RFPs that are written in such a way that uh, they take an overly amount of time and, and dollars to develop the technology to bring a solution to bear. And, and I would just footstop this maybe as my last comment, is we have seen significant outreach by customers across the federal space in asking us you know, where we are, TRL levels, technology readiness levels, on certain technologies and what the art of the possible is. And that's part of that theme of bringing commercial off the shelf technology in to help them solve their problems. But they also wanna know for those things that are uniquely focused on, um, on their requirements, where are we from a maturation standpoint? Because they no longer wanna to get too far out. You know, I, I think everybody has sort of this two to four year kind of horizon on you know, spending sort of this one-time uh, dividend that we've mm -hmm. got in the 18 and 19 budget, and they want to see product come out the other end. Uh, unfortunately, while there is still a, uh, a good hunger uh, in this audience and in me for a longer conversation, right. we'll have to draw it to a right. close. Well, Steve, thank you. Before we put a, a final capstone on it, I want uh, to make two uh, commercial announcements. This series continues as quickly as two days from now, on Wednesday evening uh, was the date that it was possible to reschedule a uh, previously uh, postponed by weather Captains of Industry event with three terrific CEOs, Andy Hove of AM General, Brad Feldman of Cubic, and Barbara Humpton of Siemens uh, uh, Government Technologies. They will be here Wednesday, same time, same station. I hope that more of you will come back for a conversation with those Captains of Industry. And then on the 1st of May, uh, another postponed event by weather, uh, we're going to have the Secretary of the Army, uh, Mark Esper, who will hear, be here to talk more about the Futures Command and the Army's uh, plans to uh, modernize its modernization program as part of another uh, companion series, the Defense Industrial Policy Series, one May in the morning for Mark Esper. Um, well, Roger, this was terrific. It's, uh, like I said, as I sat down, it's kind of exactly uh, the scope and tenor of uh, Great Captains of Industry event. Thank you very, very much. Great. Steve, thank you. Okay.